Listen, everybody, we've been in this series titled Self-Care Sundays. And it's about understanding that it is your responsibility to have peace. That it is your responsibility to have peace. And if something is taking away your peace, you have to hold yourself accountable for taking care of yourself. I was listening to my spiritual role model, God rest his soul, Dr. Miles Monroe the other day. And Dr. Miles Monroe says, sometimes Christians blame the devil too much. He says, sometimes we blame the devil to avoid accountability. Because instead of us saying, I allow something to take my peace, we say the devil been, been busy lately. He said, no, no, don't blame the devil because you haven't been guarding your mind. Don't blame the devil because you let something come into your life and steal your joy. Hold yourself accountable for your peace. So that's what Self-Care Sundays is all about. It's about creating a mindset where you are saying, I'm going to take care of me. And listen, ain't nothing selfish about it. Because if you don't take care of you, you're no good for anybody else. You can't help nobody else get peace if you don't have peace. You can't help no one else experience joy if you don't have joy. How are your children going to have joy if you don't have joy? So we got to take care of ourselves. This uh, series has been a blessing. And we've been in the gospel of Matthew since we started. And we're still there. So I ask that you would turn to the gospel of St. Matthew. We're in the ninth chapter. If you didn't bring your sword with you, it's okay. I, I got it on the jumbo screen. But I took us back, y'all. I haven't, I haven't preached from the King James Version in such a long time. When I came up in the church, I used to hear people say, I only preach from the King James Version because that's the only one authorized. And then when I went to seminary and I learned that, you know, when somebody talk about what's authorized, they don't even know what they're talking about. Because every translation has the same content. They just translate it in a way that's more readable, more digestible, because the King James got a lot of hitherto, wherefore, hence, stuff that we don't even know what it's talking about. But for this particular passage, there are a few words that were switched up in the translation, and I wanted to get to the original because I just think it has, it has some power. It speaks to directly what we want to talk about today. So the scripture reads in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 through 26, while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, my daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. I thank God for the reading of this particular passage on this Sunday morning as we get into self-care Sunday. Um, today's sermon is simple. It's not over yet. Just look at somebody and encourage them. Say, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the word that has been read in our hearing. For we know that faith cometh by the word and the word cometh by hearing. And so, Lord, as we heard the scripture in our ears, you have increased our faith on this Sunday. 
And we pray, oh God, that on today we will uh, uh, embrace this understanding that it's not over yet. That we're all going through different things along our journey. And it is easy to get discouraged. But we pray on this morning that you would encourage us. That you would lift up every head that is hung down. That you would feed our spirit revelation concerning your word. And may our declaration be, it's not over yet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. What's so amazing about this particular text is that it actually highlights the fact that everybody has some issues. Everybody has some issues. Every person on the planet is dealing with something, some type of problem. And the scripture tells us that there's nothing new underneath the sun. So the same problems that were being experienced 2,000 years ago, they're being experienced in our time. Everybody's dealing with some type of issue. So if you ever get to the point where you start to think, I'm the only one going through something, you need to think again. If you ever get to the point where you say, I'm the only person struggling in life, you need to think again. Everybody is dealing with something. Every person has some issues. And this text highlights two different people. They got two different issues, but they're both dealing with something. The first person who comes up to Jesus is a man who his name is not known in this gospel. But if you look at the other Gospels like Luke and John, they name him Jairus. He's a ruler of a synagogue, which means he's actually a spiritual leader. This man, by way of his actual position, he has a high social status, which means he's somebody in society. He has power in society. He has influence in society. People know who he is. Nevertheless, he still got some issues. Sometimes we think that success cancels a person's issues. That if we see someone who made dresses nice or drives a nice car or lives in a nice neighborhood or has a nice position or, or, or occupies some type of status in society, we assume that they got less issues than I got. This text shows us otherwise. That even the person who is perceived as having it all together has his own issues. Everybody has some issues. And then the scripture shows us that as Jesus is accompanying this man, Jesus is confronted by another person who has some issues. Now her issues are plain today because the Bible says she had an issue of blood. She had some type of sickness, some type of disease that caused her to bleed profusely. And in other Gospels, it teaches us that she has tried to find healing. She has went to different doctors. The Bible says she spent all that she had trying to find healing, and she could never find healing. So she had been dealing with her issue for a long time. And what we have to understand is some of us are in the same boat. We got some issues that are immediate, like J. Iris needing his daughter to be healed. And some of us are in the boat like this lady who has an issue that we've been dealing with for a long time. But we got some issues. And like the people in this text, we have to recognize that our issues may be bigger than us. That we, not, we may not be able to actually heal ourselves. That we may not be able to just keep on pushing through life and sometimes healing going to come. At some point, we might need to recognize that, hey, we need God to help me find healing. Maybe it's childhood trauma that you're still grappling with. Maybe it's not feeling love. Maybe it's feeling neglected or disappointed. Maybe you've been hurt along your journey. Maybe you're going through some things right now because of something that has happened last week or two weeks ago. You got some issues. But you need to recognize who can help you deal with your issues. Just like the people in this text, we got to find Jesus. It's got to be personal for us to get healed. You got to actually make up your mind and say, I want to be healed. I'm tired of carrying these issues. I'm tired of suffering and silence. I'm tired of carrying this sickness, this disease, this disorder, whatever it is that's being a burden on my life. I'm tired of it and I want to deal with it. I need to find God. 
That's what we got to get to in our life. So I just want to highlight three things that I see in this text that might be required for your healing. That if you don't do these things, you may never get your healing. The first thing is this. Sometimes desperation is required for healing. Sometimes desperation is required. In other words, you got to get desperate. You got to get to this point in your life where you say, it's either I get my healing or I'm going to keep pursuing God until I break out of this chain. That I'm going to keep pursuing my purpose because I'm so desperate to be who God has called me to be. I'm willing to do anything that God requires of me. That's desperation. They just sung the song. They said, I'll walk through the hottest desert to get to the glory of God. I'll cross over the highest mountain. You'll never do those things unless you're desperate. Because a lot of people have come so accustomed to walking around with their issues that they don't even seek healing anymore. They just made it a part of their life. They just made it a part of who they are. They're like, this is just who I am. You got to accept me for who I am because they're not desperate enough to be released from it. And so we think we got to be that way forever. The devil is a liar. One thing that God has authorized us to experience is freedom. So whatever chain is holding you down, it doesn't have the authority to go with you into your future. It may have been with you in your past, but it can't be with you in your future. You got to be desperate enough to say today, God, I want to be healed. I want to be healed. Scripture tells us in the New Living Translation, Matthew chapter nine, verse 18. Scripture says as Jesus was saying this, the leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. He said, my daughter just died. I, I, I found you because I'm dealing with an issue that needs immediate assistance. I don't know how far this man walked to get to Jesus, but we know he came from a place. He was in the home with his daughter who he recognized she was sick. She was tormented. She was afflicted. She was already on her deathbed. And he understood out of desperation, I need to find somebody who can help me. And there's a man named Jesus who is going through the town and he's healing people of every infirmity, of every sickness and every disease. I need to get into his presence and let him know what I'm dealing with because I'm that desperate. He felt powerless, so he went after God. He witnessed his daughter's situation go from bad to worse, so he went after God. He knew that he couldn't do anything about his situation. He knew that if, no matter what he tried, it would not get better unless Jesus got involved. He was desperate. And maybe we can relate to him because we have been in situations that we've witnessed go from bad to worse. Maybe we can relate because we've been in situations that we recognize are actually too powerful for us. And if I keep going the same way, nothing is actually going to change. So I need God to intervene because only God can help me deal with what I'm dealing with. That's desperation. We got to get to a point where we're desperate enough to pursue after God. This man's desperation inspired him to pursue Jesus. The lady in this text was so desperate that she reached out to Jesus. Now, you have to understand that what she actually did was interrupt this man's prayer. You got to think about it. This man came and found Jesus and said, Jesus, my daughter has just died. But if you come to my house and lay hands on her, she'll be healed. Jesus said, let's go. So Jesus is walking with this man on his way to help this man find healing. And the lady said, man, Jesus is around me. And I'm so desperate that I know you're about to help him find what he needs. But God, I need to touch the hem of your garment because I'm so desperate. I got to interrupt your prayer life just so I get what I need. That's desperation. So she came to Jesus and pressed into his presence just so she can receive what she needed. I'm only asking you this because I want you to understand that you have to be desperate for God. That you got to get to a point in your life where no excuse will keep you out of the presence of God. 
That you're so desperate for what you need from God that you're willing to sacrifice other stuff just so you get what you need from God. That you realize that if you don't get into the presence of God, you're never going to be healed. So if God will require you to fast and to pray and to study the scripture, whatever it takes for you to get what you need, you have to be willing to do it. That's desperation. Are you desperate enough to seek after God? Because if you're not desperate, you may just keep doing what you're doing. You may come to church today, leave back out, and continue doing what you've always been doing because you're not desperate enough. Are you desperate enough to pray for your children? They say, God, I love my kids so much, I got to pray for them every day. Because I don't know if there's enough prayer to slap on my kids because they need all the prayer they can get. God, I'm so desperate, I got to pray for them every day. Are you desperate enough to pray for your relationship? Like, do you want your relationship to be healthy? To the degree that you say, God, I want this thing to work. So I'm praying for it. I'm so desperate for joy in my relationship that I'm willing to pray. I'm willing to carve out some time in my schedule just to pray for my relationship. How desperate are you for joy? Are you desperate enough to go to counseling? Oh, black folk like, uh-oh. See, in our community, we got this stigma that we think it's a problem to seek an opinion from somebody else. But how bad do you want to be healed? How bad do you want to be whole? Do you really want your peace back? Do you really want your joy? Do you really want to get to the root of the issue? Are you willing to seek help? You got to be desperate to do these things. Are you desperate enough to ask God for healing in your mind? Healing in your body? Healing from your past? You got to be desperate enough to do this. So this lady understood that she had been struggling with this condition for so long, she said, I know this might be rude to interrupt what Jesus is getting ready to do for you, but I'm so desperate, y'all. I apologize after I get my healed. But I got to get healed today. She was desperate, so she went after God. Are we desperate enough to be like this lady and reach out to the Lord? Are you desperate enough to reach out to God? See, because I've learned along my journey that God is really a gentleman. He's not going to impose himself on your life. Like if you don't set aside time to read the Bible, guess what? You ain't got no time to read the Bible. If you don't set aside time to praise God for all of the good things he's done in your life, you're not going to praise God. If you don't set aside time to worship God and say, God, I thank you for my life. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my children. I thank you for everything you bless me with. If you don't set aside time to give God your praise and worship, you're never going to give them praise and worship. Because a lot of times what we need from God requires desperation on our part. And we don't want to hear the truth, but guess what? We're not desperate enough. We don't want it bad enough. We don't want to be who God has called us to. We don't want it bad enough. That's why we keep holding on to stuff. Because when we get to the point that we're desperate, it doesn't matter what's in your way. Like this lady displayed, you will push your way through to get in the presence of God. You will reach out to God no matter who's blocking you. It doesn't matter who's in the way. When you get desperate enough, you say, today's the day, God, that I'm coming into your presence. That's how desperate we have to be. This lady models for us how desperation ought to look like. No matter what's blocking you, you got to press through it. No matter what's going on in your life, you got to press through it. Keep in mind, she still was sick as she was reaching out. Sometimes you got to reach out even though you're struggling. Sometimes you got to reach out even though you're going through something in your personal life. You still got to reach out to God. She literally said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. The Bible is trying to get us to understand that sometimes desperation is required for healing. That's point number one. Point number two, sometimes a declaration of faith is required for your healing. A declaration of faith. What am I talking about when I say a declaration of faith? I'm talking about using your lips, using your mouth, using your speech to declare into the atmosphere what you actually believe. Like you have to affirm what you believe is true. That's a declaration. And you don't just want to declare anything. You want to declare your faith in God. Like, I believe God can make a way for me. So I'm not just believing it in my mind. I say it to myself. I speak it into the existence. I say, God, you can provide for me. 
I know I got more bills than I got money, but I'm trusting God that you are able to provide for me. So I'm declaring my faith. What's amazing about this text is they model for us how you should, you should declare your faith. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, the Bible says uh, that the man who came to Jesus, this is what he said. He said, my daughter is even now dead. She's gone. She can't come back. But come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. It's dead, but I know the power that you have. It doesn't look good, but I do believe that if you come, it'll change the whole situation. That's radical faith in God. Will you speak to something dead and say God can bring it back to life for you? Will you speak to what you're dealing with in your life and say God can restore this thing? And I'm not just talking about believing it in your mind. I'm talking about opening up your mouth and saying, I know it doesn't look good, but I believe God can do it. He affirmed his faith. He declared his faith. And the lady who had the issue, she did the same thing. This is what the Bible said. For she said within herself, Man, if I just touch his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, the beautiful thing about this is she didn't even say it out loud. She said it to herself. She said, if I just touch him, I won't have any more sickness. If I just touch him, I won't have any more disease. If I just get close enough to God, every shackle and chain on my life will be broken because he's just that powerful. Will you ever declare your faith? See, some Christians, we just too cute. We, we don't want to seem weird. We don't want to walk around the house and talk about this house is temporary. God getting ready to open up a door to my new one. See, you got to have a weird faith. You, you, you got to get to your point where you don't even care what people say. They're looking at you like you're going through something. This is temporary. I'm getting ready to come out of there. They're like, but you just started struggling and it's temporary. You got to affirm it. You got to declare. I know my marriage isn't where I want it to be, but that's temporary. God is getting ready to bring about a healing. I know my children aren't where I want them to be yet, but God is still dealing with them. God is not yet finished. It's not over yet. So I believe that God will do a great thing. This is a declaration of faith. See, this text seems to suggest that there is a relationship between our words and our experiences. That it seems to suggest that if he didn't come to Jesus, open up his mouth and say, she dead, but if you come and lay hands on her, she'll be healed. Maybe his daughter would have never got her healing if he had not declared his faith. It seems to suggest that the lady said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I should be made whole. That if she would have never said that in her spirit, her faith would never have made her whole. Because the Bible said, your faith has made you well. So it was her declaration that actually led to her breakthrough. I'm just trying to help you because maybe you are not receiving a breakthrough because of what you keep declaring out of your mouth. Maybe you keep talking yourself out of the promotion. Maybe you keep talking yourself out of increasing your credit score. Maybe you keep talking yourself out of having a joyful relationship because you keep saying, we'll never get to that point. Maybe you keep declaring, I'll never get the promotion. Maybe you keep declaring, I'm not adequate for God to do it for me. Maybe you keep declaring, I'm just going to have to live with this sickness. Instead of opening up your mouth and saying, God, I know you are able to break every chain in my life. I know you are able to set me free. I know you are able to provide for me. I know you are able to take me to the next level. I know you are able. What is your declaration of faith? I want everybody in here to find it before you leave today. I want you to leave today with a declaration of faith. For you and God, the only people who know what you're really dealing with. We'll never really find out unless you come and say, this is what I'm going through. So what that means is you need the Holy Spirit to help you find your declaration today. Today, what are you going to declare out of your mouth? What's going to be your declaration? Are you going to declare, I'm getting healed in the name of Jesus? Are you going to declare that promotion is mine in Jesus' name? Are you going to declare God is getting ready to part the Red Sea and make a way for me out of no way? What is going to be your declaration of faith? This between you and God. You have to declare what your declaration of faith is. Because if you're not declaring faith, you might be declaring doubts. You might be living your life talking about how things will never change. And that's not the way that God wants you to live. God doesn't want you declaring your fear. He wants you declaring your faith. There's a song. Where David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in thy sight. Are your words acceptable to God? What you're saying about your destiny, what you're saying about your life, is God saying, yeah, that's acceptable to me? Or are you settling for something less than God's best for your life? Based on what you keep speaking over your life, are your words acceptable to God? Because what we could be doing is delaying our destiny. Maybe God wants you to get to a place in two years that could take you 20 years simply because of what you speak out of your mouth. Maybe God wants you to be at a place in your relationship where you really are unified and you really are on the same page. But you keep speaking out of your mouth that we keep having problems and he keep doing this and she keep doing that. And that's why you're not experiencing the freedom of God, because you keep speaking against it. We could be delaying what God has for us simply based on what we speak. So this text just shows us that sometimes a declaration of faith is required for healing. And the third thing that I want to talk about is that sometimes the divine presence of God is required for healing. That there's some healing that will never happen on the outside of God. That you can go to every doctor, you can go to every therapist, every counselor, but until God gets involved, you'll still carry that bondage. That there's some chains that only God can break off of your life. That there's some shame and some guilt and some regret that keeps you bound, and you will never get free until God takes it from you. So you need the divine presence of God. Scripture shows us in chapter 9, verse 23 to 25, the Bible says, And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, and he saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. Minstrels are flute players. Just put a pen in that. We're going to talk about flute players. He saw the minstrels and the people making noise. He said unto them, hey, hey, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. I said, now, where did they find this guy at? He can't determine somebody's sleep from somebody who's dead. They laughed at him. But when the people were put forth, everybody declared, put forth. We're going to deal with that too. He went in, took her by the hand, and the maid arose. To understand the magnitude of what's taking place, you got to understand Jewish culture. See, because in Judaism, it was a custom that when a person died, they actually brought in the flute players. That's how you know somebody dead. They said, doo, 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 and people are in there crying and wailing. They took funerals so serious that they would hire people in there to cry. For real. They said, you ain't in a part of the family, but we'll pay you to come in here and cry with us. That was their custom. They went and got the flute player. They got the instrument. They started wailing. They started making noise. That certified that it's dead. So what the scripture is trying to get us to understand that the people had gathered for the funeral. In fact, they had already pronounced her dead and they had already started having the funeral when Jesus came in. But just look to somebody and say, but it wasn't over yet. It wasn't over yet. See, what God is trying to get us to understand that there are some people who will come around us who are willing to bury us before it's time. That there are some people in our life that will say it is over before God says it's over. That there are some people in your life, they don't even believe that you're going to come back from this setback. That there are some people who don't think you can recover from what you've gone through in your life. That there are some people who believe you'll never bounce back from what you are dealing with in your life. So guess what? They showing up just to play the flute in your life. Yeah, and guess what? They ready to bury you and God said it's not over for you. That's why it's important for you to understand who you are around. Because everybody don't want to see you alive. Everybody don't want to see you win. Everybody don't want to see you get the promotion. There are some people, they come in to play the flute. Oh, she dead now? Hey, y'all. They'll celebrate you when you're dead, but won't give you an applaud when you're alive. God is trying to teach us about this. But the good thing about God is, as long as God comes on the scene, even if it looks dead, it can still live. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody. Even if it looks like it's over, God says, it's not over yet. I'm on the scene now. That if God be for me, he's greater than the whole world against me. That if God be for me, even death can't hold me. But God got to deal with these minstrels. God got to deal with everybody who want to play a flute in your life. 
Everybody who want to come and celebrate that it's time to bury you, God said, I'm going to deal with them. This is what the Bible said. I got to show you this in the, in, in the, uh, the New King James because I like the wording of this. Check this out. The Bible says, but when the crowd was put outside. Oh, my goodness. Somebody, y'all got to catch that. See, y'all think, think the Bible is here to... Sometimes the Bible get a little, you know, hey, y'all in here, plan you know what? Get off. Oh, man, y'all got to understand this. Did y'all catch that? The Bible says, when the crowd was put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. When the crowd was put outside, Jesus healed her. When the crowd was put outside, Jesus performed the miracle. Sometimes Jesus has to remove people from your life before he starts to work in your life. Sometimes Jesus has to remove people from your life before he performs the miracle that you've been praying about. Sometimes God has to let some people walk away from you before he does the new thing in your life. But the problem with us is we think everybody's for us. Somebody's a flute player. They only come in because they think it's time to bury you. They, they only around because they see that you actually getting ready to leave. You, you having a bad day. You going through some stuff. So they ain't coming to celebrate you. They coming to play the flute because it's your funeral. Jesus said, get out. Oh, y'all ain't really here. And so, so what I'm saying is, when God starts removing people from your life, let them go. <laughs> when God starts taking people away from you, let them walk. When the people who were with you all this time say, all right, I'm going on, say, all right, you be blessed now. Don't say, come on back in my life. Because if you say, come on back, you might be delaying your blessing. Maybe God said, until they leave, I can't do it. Until they walk away, I can't give you your breakthrough. I got a breakthrough for you, but there's too many people in here playing the flute. There's too many people in here making noise around you. And once they leave, then I can deal with you. See, I've learned that the best time we have with God is when we're with God by ourselves. I know you love people, but sometimes you got to get away from people. Because maybe God is not bringing forth that breakthrough because you're too crowded. Jesus came in and he said, I need everybody out so I can deal with this one by myself. And I'm declaring over your life, it's no different for you. God says, I want to heal you, but you're relying on other people for healing. So until those people get out of the way, I can't come into your life. I, I know you want me to provide for you, but you keep relying on your job. And you don't recognize that I'm the source, your job is the resource. That even if that job don't work out, I'll just get you another resource. But if you keep holding on to that job, I can't do the new thing. I know you love your homegirls and homeboys, your old friends. But God said, it might be that they're in the way of me. God is saying, I want to come in. I want to bring about a healing. I want to take you to the next level. I want to do the new thing in your life. And when I do it, I don't even want anybody else to take credit for it. I want everybody to be out the way. So when you come out walking, they say, but she was dead, but she yet lives. Because God wants to declare it's not over yet. Hallelujah. I bless God for this word today. And I'm going to conclude with this. Whoo, this is good right here, y'all. God will give you a testimony. Just encourage somebody and say, God getting ready to give you a testimony. You have to understand what's taking place in this passage, y'all. A man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter has died. He came in with an issue and left out with a testimony. A lady came in bleeding. She came in with a disease. She came in with a sickness and left out with a testimony. He learned. He said, man, I got a problem, but God is the answer to my problem. She said, I got an issue, but she learned Jesus can deal with my issue. So sometimes you'll come in with a problem, but you'll leave out with a testimony. So stop declaring that it's a problem and, and declare that it's getting ready to be a testimony. That I'm getting ready to declare out of my mouth. I got an issue today, but tomorrow I'm going to have a testimony. 
I'm going through something right now, but tomorrow I'm going to have a testimony. I'm dealing with a struggle in my life right now, but God is getting ready to do a new thing in my life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God is getting ready to give me a testimony so that when I leave, I can simply declare I survived what I went through. Maybe that's your declaration. For those of you who haven't found your declaration of faith, maybe that's it. I survived what I went through. That the devil tried to take me out, but I survived. I had a lot of issues, but I survived. I went through hell and high water, but I survived. I was sick and afflicted, but I survived. I didn't have all the strength at the moment that I needed it, but I survived what I went through. The devil came at all of my family at the same time, but we survived. Maybe your testimony is, even when the enemy comes against me, it doesn't matter because God is going to protect me enough so that at the end of the day, I can declare I survived. I survived every attack of the enemy. You have to understand that whatever has tried to kill you didn't take you out. That you're still here this morning. God sent you here because God just wanted to reaffirm in your life that the devil did try to kill you, but you survived. That the problems did try to ruin your destiny, but you survived. And the reason why you survived is because God wants to use you to help somebody else develop their testimony. Because somebody else is going to come along you and say, guess what? I got some issues. And you can declare, I had some issues too. But God dealt with that. Somebody going to say, hey, my family member is sick. And you say, I had a family member who was sick too. But they survived. Why? Because God wants to give you a testimony. All for his glory. You have to be desperate. You have to get to a point in your life where you can declare what you want to experience. It may not be your experience at the moment, but you have to have enough belief that it will be my experience. You have to get to a point where you recognize the power that God has, that you can affirm out of your mouth that if I'm with God, I'm going to be okay. That if God is for me, I'm going to be okay. That no matter how dead it appears to be, God can bring new life into that thing. That I believe that God is able because it's not over yet. Just declare one more time, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. I don't know what you are dealing with in your personal life, in your health, in your mind, in your uh, marriage with your children. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I do know one thing. It's not over yet. Don't allow the enemy to make you think that what you are dealing with right now is permanent because everything is temporary. There's a season for everything under the earth, which means everything that we experience is only for a short time. But we have to believe that. You have to declare that this is seasonal. It's not over yet. I'm going to hold on to God to see what the end is going to be. And I know without a doubt, when it is all said and done, God is going to give me a testimony. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together for God right there. Glory to God.